I'd like you to imagine two scenarios with me. <clears throat> Scenario number one, <clears throat> there's a job that you're really, really interested in having. You've looked up, you found this job, you feel like you're probably not qualified for the job, you've read through all of the qualifications and you realize you probably don't have all that's necessary to do this job, but still, your heart really, really wants it. And so, you seek out the woman who has posted the job and you tell her, hey look, I know that I'm not qualified enough for this job. But if you hire me, I will work incredibly hard and I will go after this and I will, I can do this job, give it to me. And she looks at your qualifications and says, yes, you indeed are not qualified for this job. But hey, why not? I like your spirit. I like the fact that you want to do this. I'll give you a chance. Okay, that's scenario number one. Scenario two, same job, same woman offering the job, same lack of qualifications on your part for that job, but this time you don't know the job exists. This time you're just busy uh, working where you've been working and she comes to you and says to you, hey, I got a job at my company or I got a job where I work that I'd like you to apply for. So you take a look at the job and you're like, I am not qualified to do that job. And she says, I know you think you're not qualified and to be honest, you're not. But I believe that you can do this. I want you to come work for me. Will you come and take this job? Question, do those two scenarios feel different? Even though it's the same job, same you, same lack of qualifications, same boss offering the job, they feel different, don't they? Especially if you take that job and you start getting into or having some trouble because of your lack of qualifications. It feels very different who is responsible, right, going forward? You versus uh, her, like, well, hey, you asked me to come do this job, versus, well, you said you could do it. Two different scenarios. I'd like to label the first scenario uh, that of desire, ambition, and effort. So you saw a job, you wanted the job, you convinced her you could do the job, and you got the job because of desire, ambition, and effort. I'd like to label the second scenario as faith, obedience, and submission. You didn't go looking for the job. She came and offered it to you. You don't believe you could do it, but because she thinks you can, You've chosen to believe and submit to her request for you to come and work for her. Now I want to be careful. I've put up two scenarios, one and two, and I've labeled them. Now you might be thinking, ah, this is church. So therefore, scenario one, desire, ambition, and effort, that must be bad. And scenario two, that's got churchy words in it, like faith and obedience and submission, so that must be good. Please don't think that way. There are lots and lots of examples in the Bible of desire, ambition, effort, scenario number one, that are pleasing to the Lord. So for example, when David goes to fight Goliath, it's scenario number one. He has desire, ambition, and effort. He wants to make right something that's wrong. This has been impressed upon his heart, and when he goes to Saul, he basically says, I know I'm not qualified for this job, but give it to me anyway. And Saul is impressed by his desire, ambition, and effort, and he gives him the job. And that's a beautiful story. Later on, David wants to build God a temple. That is desire, ambition, and effort. It's godly desire. And the Lord says, I am so pleased that you want to do this. I'm not going to let you do it, but I'm so pleased that you want to. And so God blesses him because of his desire, ambition, and effort. In the New Testament, it says if anyone desires to be an elder or an overseer, they are desiring a good thing. That is a blessing from the Lord. So please don't look at these words and think, aha, scenario one bad, scenario two good. No, I'm saying that both of these, when done in a godly, God-honoring way, are good things. It's just that this morning, our passage is a scenario two passage. And so we're going to be focusing this morning on some of the blessings and benefits of faith, obedience, and submission. And our passage this morning is one that you might have thought would be one of desire, ambition, and effort. 
but it's actually one of faith, obedience, and submission. And this gives us the chance to see some of the blessings that come from scenario two without in any way denigrating desire, ambition, and effort. So everybody's with me? Scenario one can be used in a God-honoring, God-pleasing way, but our passage this morning is about scenario two, faith, obedience, and submission, and that gives us the chance to see some of the blessings that come from doing things that way. So with that introduction, would you please take a Bible and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, if you're using one of the church Bibles, it's page 796. Matthew 14. For the last couple of weeks, we've been in this chapter in Matthew's gospel about halfway through the 28th chapter, first book of the New Testament. Two weeks ago, we looked at the story of uh, Herod beheading John the Baptist. Last week, we looked at the story of Jesus feeding 5,000. And this week, we get to look at the story of Jesus and Peter walking on the water, which follows right after the feeding of the 5,000. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 22, and I'll read to the end of the chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed." When we take trips to Israel, one of the first places we usually stop is at the Sea of Galilee where this took place. And we stay in a a kibbutz or a a hotel sort of right there at the Sea of Galilee. And because of jet lag, these are the days that I'm usually up super early. And so it's a real great joy to be on the shores of the Sea of Galilee while it's still dark outside and to get up, to go outside, to walk around, to pray, to sit there right where this happened. And I will admit to you that most years that we do this, I will walk over to the edge of the water, still dark, and I will say, Lord, no one is watching. (laughs) No one's going to see. I promise I won't tell anyone. (laughs) But would you please let me walk on the water? I said, if you do, I will not tell anybody that this happened. This will just be between you and me. And then I take a step. I bet you want to know what happens next. (laughs) I'm not allowed to tell you. No, I'm just kidding. Every time my feet get wet. So, but wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't that be great to be like, hey man, just five, Lord, just five steps out on the water and I'll go right back. I think that would be super encouraging. That would be sort of scenario one, desire, ambition, and effort. Like I would really like to walk on water. Like I think that would be really fantastic. And I actually believe that even though every time I've done it, my feet have gotten wet, every time I believe that that desire, ambition, and effort is actually pleasing to the Lord, like, because I actually think he can do it. And I would really like to do it. And so in that desire, I, I hope that it's pleasing to him. Now, in future years, if I do, I won't be able to tell you, but 
My sense is, is that the Lord has not said yes to that yet. Now you might think that that's how Peter is approaching his experience. I would think that Peter sees Jesus walking on the water and wants to do it, and that what we have in Matthew 14 is scenario one, desire, ambition, and effort. But actually, the passage goes out of its way to tell us this is not a scenario one situation, this is a scenario two situation. This is a situation of faith, submission, and obedience. Look at it with me, verse 28. So they're in the boat, the wind's against them, Jesus is walking on the water, not that far from them, they see him, no one's ever seen anybody walk on water before, so they're sure it's a ghost. Jesus says, no, it's not a ghost, it's me. And then Peter says, verse 28, Lord, if it's you. Now in English, that could have two different readings. That could be like, if it's you, like he's doubting, or it could be, since it's you. In English, it's unclear, but in Greek, it's very clear. It works differently in Greek. Peter's not doubting that this is Jesus. The way the Greek is written is written in such a way that he believes that this is Jesus. So he's not doubting whether this is Jesus or not. He's recognized him as Jesus and he's saying, since it's you, Lord. And then look what he says next. What I would expect is, hey, since it's you, can I come join you? Wouldn't it be great? Would you please let me walk on water? But notice what Peter says. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now the word that's translated tell me is probably translated maybe a little weakly. This word actually means order me or command me to do something. It's used 25 times in the New Testament only by, in books written by either Matthew or Luke. Those are the only two people that use this word. Luke uses it all the time in the book of Acts when you've got like commanders and soldiers and people are ordering each other around. This word shows up in those contexts for ordering, commanding, insisting that somebody do something. Matthew's already used this verb twice in this chapter alone. He used it back in verse nine when it says the king, that's Herod, was distressed but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that his stepdaughter's request be granted. Herod's in charge. The guards work for Herod. When it's time for John the Baptist to suffer his beheading, Herod orders the guards to go and do this. That's our word. It showed up in the feeding of the 5,000 as well. Verse 19, it says, and Jesus directed the people to sit down. Now, I'm sure he did it very politely, but Jesus is telling them, sit down. This is not, hey, if you wanna be seated, fine. If not, just stay standing. No, this is an instruction from Jesus to them. It's a command to say, sit down. That's because he wants everybody to see the food that's being distributed and the miraculous nature of everyone being fed, and that won't work if people are standing. So he orders them to sit down. So Peter is effectively saying to Jesus, Lord, since it's you, command me to come out on the lake. Order me to do this. The fact that this is the right reading is confirmed by verse 29. Jesus' response is not, yeah, sure, if you want to come, go ahead. It says in verse 29, he commands him to come. The word Come here is in the imperative. It's a command from Jesus. Basically, G Peter says, order me to come on the water. Jesus turns around and says, I order you, come out on the water. Now this fits within the context of the wider passage. We're only looking at Peter walking on water. But in the wider passage, look at verse 22. Immediately Jesus did what? Made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. The disciples didn't choose to get into the boat. This was not them figuring, okay, well this would be the fastest way to get from point A to point B. Jesus ordered them into the boat. They're in the middle of that lake even though he knows a storm is coming, not of their own choosing, but out of faith, obedience, and submission. And so the whole passage is in a scenario two situation. 
And so although we might expect that Peter has requested through desire, ambition, and effort to walk on water, this is actually not one of those situations. Matthew has gone out of his way to show us this is a situation of faith, obedience, and submission. Peter has asked Jesus to order him onto the lake. Jesus has commanded him to come. And Peter is on the lake out of obedience, submission, and faith. Because that's the case, it lets us see three things about situations like scenario two. First, because Jesus orders Peter onto the lake, Peter's able to walk on water. You see, he needs faith to be able to walk on water, and sometimes, if you and I are honest, the idea of faith is a little bit hard to grasp. It's hard to tell somebody, believe. Well, what do you do? How do you believe? How do you make yourself believe? How do you convince yourself to believe something? It can feel all in your head, and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And so God does something very kind He has this thing that he refers to as the obedience of faith, meaning that what God does is he often just commands us to do something because when you obey, you're exercising faith. Instead of telling Peter, try to think of enough faith to be able to walk on the water, Jesus just simply does something very kind to him. He just says, get out of the boat. And when Peter chooses to obey, he's exercising faith. And when he exercises faith, faith opens up the power of God in the situation. Earlier on in Matthew, Jesus says, whoever hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a man who built his house on the rock. When Peter gets out of the boat, it's like he's literally walking on rock. That's because he's heard and obeyed. That's his exercise of faith. And so out of Jesus' kindness... Instead of saying to Peter, come on, try to believe, he just simply says, don't think about it. Just do what I'm telling you to do. And when Peter does, he exercises enough faith to be able to walk on water. So that's the first result of scenario two, the faith obedience submission, is that when we obey, it creates faith. Second is that it does raise a challenge. When you are in a scenario two type situation, when you are in a situation of faith, submission, and obedience, it raises the possibility of not having enough faith. It raises the possibility of doubt. You see, Peter is starting to sink in this story, not because he lacks desire, ambition, or effort. It's not one of those situations. But because this is a faith, obedience, a submission situation, Peter gets into the middle of it, and one of the dangers is is that he can begin to lose faith. He can begin to doubt. And so he looks around, and he sees the storm, and he sees the wind, and he sees the waves, and doubts creep into his heart, and he begins to sink. But the third thing we can see from this passage about these faith, submission, and obedience situations is that Peter has put himself into Jesus' hands, which means that even though he's sinking, he's as safe as he could possibly be. Remember back to the opening scenario from the two different jobs? Who is responsible when the boss, when she's asking you to come take the job even though you're not qualified? Is she not somewhat responsible for making sure you don't fail at this job? When you are in a faith, submission, and obedience situation, who is responsible for Peter not drowning? Jesus. Peter is not qualified to walk on water. But Peter is not out on the water because he wants to be out on the water. He's out on the water because Jesus ordered him out on the water. Once Jesus orders him out on the water, who is now responsible for ensuring that he walks on water? Jesus, that's why we say he can sink, but he cannot drown because he is there at Jesus' command. He's there in obedience. Don't miss the power of what is happening here. Peter's life has been placed in Jesus' hands. Jesus is totally responsible for what happens with Peter. 
He's ordered him to walk on water. Peter is trying to obey. Jesus is responsible for making him obey. Now, I'm not saying that if he had gotten out on the water because of desire, ambition, and effort that Jesus wouldn't have saved him. But what I am saying is because he's there out of obedience, Jesus is obligated to save him. He's obligated to help him. And that's indeed what happens. All right, so what do we do with this teaching? Well, in just a few minutes, <clears throat> we're going to see some people walk on water. What I mean by that is we're going to celebrate baptisms together. And baptism is not a desire, ambition, effort kind of thing. God did not say, hey, anybody who wants to get baptized, go right ahead. You're free to do so. That is not how this works. What God does is baptism is a faith, obedience, submission kind of thing. Every single person is commanded by God to be baptized. This is not optional. It's compulsory. Why has God done that? Not out of anger, but out of kindness. Sometimes it's hard to know, do I really believe? If you're like me, you have doubts, you have struggles. You're like, how does this work? It can be difficult to think, do I have enough faith? Do I really believe all the right things? This is the kindness of God. He simply says, just obey. Just get baptized. Just do what I'm asking you to do. Because when you do that, you will be exercising faith. And so what we're going to see is for the four people who are baptized today, we're going to see them exercising faith. That's why I say you're going to see them walking on water. Meaning that because faith is present in their obedience, now heaven is opened up and the Spirit can come on them. In the waters of baptism, we say the Spirit shows up and does something powerful for the person who's being baptized. That's because God has thrown this into a faith, obedience, submission kind of thing. And by doing so, he's made it pretty straightforward. You and I are commanded to be baptized. And this is God's kindness. So that all we have to do is simply choose to obey. And when we choose to obey, we'll be exercising faith. And when we exercise faith, God's spirit will be present. Now, it does in baptism also create the possibility for doubt. You can get up there and you can look out over this big auditorium and you can think of it like wind and waves and you can feel like, I'm not going to make it. You can start. That is true. That's what happens in a faith, obedience, submission kind of situation. There's a very real possibility that you might think, I can't share my testimony in front of all of these people. I can't get up and do this. I can't endure all the spiritual warfare that might go with it. That is a very real possibility. And it happens all the time. But you know the really great news? Is that even if you start sinking, you will not drown either literally or metaphorically. <laughs> this is why in baptism, someone is putting you down into the water and picking you back up. It is a sign and a symbol that you are there, not under your own strength or your own desire or your own energy or your own effort. You are doing this out of obedience and guess who is now on the hook to make sure you get through baptism? It's Jesus. There is nothing that will happen to you from the crowds, from the testimony, from the spiritual warfare that will cause you not to obey because if you're doing it in obedience to Jesus, he will get you through it. And so I can't wait to see it. In just a few minutes, we're going to see four people from this church literally walk on water. Before we do, let me share just a couple of other areas in which this truth can be applied to our lives. For those here who maybe are not yet Christians or are struggling with what does it mean to be a Christian? How does someone become a Christian? Maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm not sure if I want to be a Christian or if I am, how do I become one? When we normally talk about becoming a Christian, we usually use language from scenario one, from desire, ambition, effort. We say things like, if you want eternal life, 
If you would like to be, have your sins forgiven, if you would like to have Jesus be a part of your life, if you would like for God to come into your life and to give you peace, then accept Jesus. And that's all very valid and very true and very real. But perhaps you're struggling with the invitation. Like, well, how do I know if I really want that or not? How do I know how I would do that if I did want it? There is another way to think about becoming a Christian, which does not invalidate scenario one, but is actually a part of scenario two. You can think of it this way. It's recorded in a gospel presentation in the book of Acts, chapter 17, this way. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance But now he, what? Commands all people everywhere to repent. Not an option. He commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. Here's how God is doing this, not in an angry way, but in an incredibly kind way. You might be saying, well, how does somebody have faith? Well, what does this say to do? You're commanded to repent. If you choose to repent, you are exercising saving faith. If this morning you repent of your sins to God. If you simply say to God in the quiet of your heart, I've not been the person I was supposed to be. I have fallen short of what you want for me. If you obey what he commands you to do, you are exercising faith. This is the kindness of God. Instead of saying, try to believe, try to summon up enough trust, try to have enough faith, God just says, let me make it very simple for you. Repent. And if you and I choose to repent, We'll be saved. We will receive eternal life. We will be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We will have forgiveness for all our sins. And God in his kindness is just simply saying to you, if you're struggling with this whole thing, just realize I'm ordering you out on the water. And if you get out of the boat to walk on the water by simply repenting, you'll be saved. Last sort of application before we uh, get to experience the joys of baptism is that for those who are already Christians, let me say that you and I can actually do what Peter did here, which is to take something that you think might go in scenario one and try to throw it into scenario two. Meaning taking something that you normally would think of as a desire, effort, ambition kind of thing and pushing it into a faith, obedience, submission kind of thing. Take, for example, finding a spouse. Of course, you can use the desire, ambition, effort. You can sort of go on dates. You can work hard. You can ask the Lord, Lord, this is the person I'm attracted to. Could you please make this work? And that can be a very God-honoring, that can be a very blessed process for finding a spouse. But you can also do what Peter did. Which is, Lord, command me to marry that person. Order me out on the water. Tell me who it is you are commanding me to marry. Now you might think, well, how would I know what he's saying in response to that? Here's the really great news. Once it gets pushed into the faith, obedience, submission category, who's in charge? Jesus is which means he's responsible for communicating whoever he wants you to marry to you. You see, here in the story, we don't know. When Peter says, order me out on the lake, he's given up control of deciding how he's going to hear that information. Jesus speaks to him, but he might have waved him out. He could have walked over and gotten him and brought him out onto the water. He could have caused lightning to strike, and Peter got super scared and jumped out onto the water. Jesus could have made the boat sink and everybody's got to walk on the water. (laughs) The point is, is once you throw this into a scenario two, you're not in charge anymore. You don't have to worry about it. If you ask God, command me to do this, it's now up to God how he's going to communicate what he's commanding you to you. And so the encouragement for you and I is there are lots of situations that we might naturally default to 
making decisions on the basis of a desire, ambition, effort, and that's pleasing to God and a blessing. It's a David and Goliath. It's a David in the temple. It's a wanting to be an elder in the church. Lots of blessings. But this passage says that something special can happen when you're in a faith, obedience, and submission sort of situation. And maybe there's something going on in your life right now in which the Lord is wanting to use this passage today, today to say to you, I know you want this. Peter wanted to walk on water. But Peter turned it over to the Lord and said, you command me because then I'll be able to exercise faith. And even if I doubt, you will carry me safely through because my life is in your hands. Let's pray together, and then we're going to watch some people walk on water. Lord Jesus, give us understanding of this teaching. Cause us, as we think through these various things in our own lives, to be willing to trust you enough to say you're Lord and we're not. And Lord, since you're Lord, since you have the name above every name, order us to do these things, God, and give us the faith to obey. Thank you for this opportunity. Bless those who are being baptized for their submission, their faith, and their obedience. And Lord, may we see heaven open up and your spirit descend in a powerful way because of this obedience. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.